as we know, race as a scientific identity simply doesn't exist. There's no such thing as racial difference when you look at DNA. And so racial di distinctions don't have a scientific basis. But of course, when you look at American history, race has a deep connection to uh, social position and to the way in which the overall society is uh, organized. Now, this point was made uh, this past year by Isabel Wilkerson in a powerful book called Caste, where she basically equates uh, racial identities with the caste system, uh, as is the case in India, darker skinned people being at the bottom of that caste system and lighter skinned people being at the top of that caste system. So really, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of examination of American history to understand this systematic dehumanization of the lowest ranked people in order to keep them at the bottom of the hierarchy and to justify all the protocols of enforcement, in other words, to justify the slavery and the, and the policing and all of the things that happen here. So notice that Isabel Wilkerson in this quote says that the caste system is also an artificial construction. It's artificial, but it becomes real because over time, as she says in that second part of the quote, the worn grooves of comforting routines and unthinking expectations, patterns of social order. So again, this, the, these social patterns are so deeply ingrained in the American story and in our own personal experiences, the lived experiences in many cases, that the caste system becomes in essence uh, reinforced by, so by our own experiences and by the system in which we live. So caste is the system and is the central metaphor for racial identity in the United States. Now, Obviously, this begins with the institution of slavery, which was for 250 years, or about 250 years, the conversion of human beings into currency, into machines. I'm, I'm quoting uh, Wilkerson here, who existed solely for the profit of their owners to be worked as long as the owners desired, who had no rights over their bodies or loved ones who could be mortgaged, bred, won in a bet, given in his wedding presents, bequeathed to heirs, sold away from spouses or children to cover an owner's debt or despite a rival or to settle an estate. And if you think about this, this idea of the construction of racial inferiority, uh, what happens in Bacon's Rebellion where uh, the, the, there's a need for a, an identified lower class by sight. And obviously you can't do that with white people because they can mix into the population. Native Americans could mix into the native population and could escape to the West very easily. But African Americans in part because that they were immune to the diseases that Europeans carry, unlike the Native Americans, and because their, of their work ethic, frankly, I mean, the very thing that, that encouraged the original enslavement of the, of the African American was the fact that they were uh, extremely hard working. So if you think about how uh, the institution of slavery destroys uh, African American identity and really African identity, the first thing you do is you is you eliminate uh, the previous forms of identity. And so you take away all of the tribal uh, identity. So all of the jewelry, all of the uh, in, in some cases, the, 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 the way the hair was cut. So the first thing that they would do is, is they would take off their clothes and shave uh, the hair of, of the enslaved peoples as they were being enslaved. And this systematic separation of black families happened not only on the slave block, it happened, in fact, when they were in line in, in South Carolina, for example, one of the primary ports in the South, they would make sure that people coming in from the same tribe weren't with other people of that same tribe. So they would they would separate them. So immediately you couldn't hold on to your linguistic identity or to your tribal identity. And that separation was a key strategy. The taking away of their language, uh, punishing and whipping people for for speaking African languages, um, forcing them to speak English. Uh, and then eventually to adopt Christianity, which was complicated because uh, according to Christian law, you, you can't enslave people of your religion. But the Southerners found 
creative ways to get around that. Um, and so this whole idea of the denial of bodily autonomy, not allowing people to do what they want when they want to, that, that forced labor, forced schedule, uh, denial of, of bodily autonomy in the form of rape of women on the plantation, the humiliation of people, whether or not they deserved it. Um, so public whippings, public uh, scoldings, these sorts of things were done, particularly by the slave breakers and the slave breakers. These people tended to be lower class whites who would who would institute this this slave system. Um, so getting uh, poorer whites on on the side of the of the wealthier whites and, and using the institution of slavery to both create blackness in the sense of equating it with servitude and whiteness, equating it with power. Um, and this, this interesting last point, the accusations of laziness and criminality, which really was part of the, the system all along. This, this, this was this idea of accusing, which is really, if you think about it, a, a tremendously ironic thing with these white people, plantation owners who were sitting on their porches or even in other, you know, not even near the plantation, accusing the black people that were working for them of being lazy um, when effectively they were they were working to the to the themselves to the bone every single day so the way this plays out on the plantation is uh there is racial hierarchy which is defined in part by skin color so there's a difference between a field slave and a house slave um field slaves tend to be darker skinned and that was because in many cases the house slaves were were the children or or uh descendants of of that slave owning family because of the the uh, children that were conceived by uh, the enslaved women and this created obviously some some extremely uncomfortable situations for the white plantation uh, uh, owners wives who would know very well that the, the people serving them would be the children of, of their husband uh, by by another enslaved woman and so this racial hierarchy formed because the the house slaves were given preference uh, frequently they were given in some cases they were given wages the ability to go into town the ability again more freedom more rights uh, more privilege so so there was privilege that was connected to proximity to the slave owner and also to the skin color within the, the black community uh, the enslaved black community and if you look at free blacks, frequently free blacks were also lighter skinned. So you, you see if you are a black person that the people who are free are lighter skinned uh, and you yourself begin to assume that role of, of, of the, the oppressed enslaved person. So how does this begin to define caste? It, it defines caste by, by even within the black community, hiring people who are lighter skin in many cases to be um, the, the managers of, of the plantation. Uh, and so you're, you're, you're reinforcing it in the social and economic system. Now, I don't think it is all that surprising to realize that slavery uh, led to extraordinary amounts of wealth to the white people who benefited from it. And these, if you were a white person living anywhere in the United States in the 19th century, you were benefiting from it either directly or indirectly. To read this quote, uh, by 1860, there were more millionaires living in the lower Mississippi Valley than anywhere else in the United States. And this is important. The nearly 4 million slaves were worth almost three and a half billion dollars, the largest financial asset in the economy worth more than all the manufacturing and railroads combined. And because they were tied to the economy of the North, uh, they were the, the amount of, of money that was being extracted from the labor of enslaved people, uh, the amount of property and the amount of privilege is just overwhelming. If you really stop and think about this, uh, it, it really, is no surprise, but it's still the, the foundations of the American economy, uh, the foundations of American wealth were built by African Americans. Uh, and they were, they were given none of it. Uh, or 
if you really think about it, it we're given just a, 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 an infinitesimal uh, fraction of it. If you think about free blacks and um, uh, the the free black community that is able to rise up, it's just it's just not where the majority of the country is. So if you move forward a little bit, the construction of race we'll talk more about it in terms in the South in a second. But as you move towards the, the later part of the 19th century, as you move into Jim Crow laws, you begin to get into this, this pseudoscience of race, this idea that there were, and this is interesting because this was taught as late as the 1950s. If you were, if you were in a science class, you learned that there were three classes of human beings, the Negroid, the Caucasian, and the Mongoloid. So Asians, Europeans, and Africans. And there were all of these studies about, about head sizes and facial features. And these were, you can see from the pictures on the right, equating the Caucasian with the Greek, which was ridiculous because most uh, Americans came from Northern Europe. They were barbarians. The Greeks and, and the Romans saw them as completely not at all connected to them. But there's this fake history that gets developed in the, in the, uh, in the books uh, in, in the science connecting Caucasians to Greeks and to Romans and uh, connecting Asians to uh, uh, this sort of lower, this lower form. And of course, the, the Asian is used as the, as the buffer between the lowest form, which was, which was the Negro or the black person who was equated with apes. And you can see this sort of trying to, to draw the pictures of Africans to, to equate them with, uh, with monkeys, and that was this this whole pseudoscience, which began to develop this construction of blackness scientifically to reinforce the social social caste system, which was already in existence. Now, in the South, some of you, I think, if you've, take, you've taken sociology, you've studied this, but this whole idea of how do you determine where someone falls in the racial system? You know, can you just tell by looking at somebody? Um, frequently, children of of black and white people or, or mixed race uh, people can be, can be very dark or very light, depending on the, the, the individual genetics. Um, but what's important about this is that there's this kind of racial absolutism in, in uh, American law, generally speaking. So mo in most cases, the, the, the single drop rule was, and this was, this was put into place really alongside um, the, the institution of slavery that any African blood, or even if you had small amounts of Native American blood or even Asian blood would classify someone as black. And this would depend on areas of the country. This gets really confusing because in Virginia, for example, um, they begin with their first racial identity law uh, has the 1 16th black as the threshold for being black. But then what they realize is that many of the early Virginian settlers were actually ancestors of Pocahontas, who was Native American. And because she was counted as black, they had to redefine blackness, basically saying uh, 1 16th, except for uh, those people who are, who are descendants of Pocahontas or of certain uh, uh, Native American tribes you can be counted as white because they were already in the leadership. So they basically wrote themselves out of the, uh, of the law. And at the same time, you have, you have this, uh, Virginia changes this. So a uh, hundred years later, it's, it's, you know, an eighth black. And so you literally where you are in, in terms of the, the identity of it is classified by um, changing uh, targets over time. And as you can see, and, and as late as 1983, there's, there's still laws in the South talking about, about this. Now, the whole idea of where this idea of, of single drop uh, comes from, it, it comes from the institution of slavery, but it also comes through the story of, of the curse of Ham. Um, Ham being one of Noah's sons who sees him naked. And so there's this, uh, there's this uh, assumption of sexual deviancy here, again, connecting uh, blackness to sexual deviance and to criminality and connecting it through a religious text gives you the trifecta. So you African Americans are now criminals, they are inferior, and this is justified by the Bible. So if you put all these things together, the construction of the American caste system runs very deep uh, and it is reinforced 
by the history that follows.